engineer. And I used data from environmental systems to make computer models, but stop right there. I bet I lost half of you at the word engineer. There's something about that word and the way engineering equals mass that gets people scanning for the exits. Or maybe you're thinking, engineering, eh? Well, this is going to be dull. Well, I'm here to tell you, environmental engineering is so not dull. It can be exhilarating, it can be excruciating, and it can be empowering. And I'm going to give you a window into my version of those three things. And I'm also hoping that maybe one young person somewhere will pick up the baton of environmental engineering and run with it, because we certainly are faced with a lot of environmental challenges, and we need all the good brains we can get. And I'm particularly talking to you if you're into science and you think you're not into maths. OK, let me explain. An environmental model is a tool to predict what's going to happen. We take everything we know about the science of this system and we translate it into maths and then into computer code and then we can ask it questions. So, say I want to use a groundwater resource to irrigate some farmland but I'm going to be releasing nutrients into the downstream waterways. Or I want to build a mine and then after I'm done mining the groundwater rebounds and there's a lake which wasn't there before. Or if I want to build a new suburb or a highway through an area that's got reactive soils. What's going to happen? More and more environmental regulators are asking us to predict in advance, before you even get your approvals to do your work, what's going to happen to the soils, to the groundwater, to the streams, to the vegetation even. But environmental systems are complex. If you get a person who knows about maths, and only maths, to make a model of an environmental system, key processes can get missed, and you can end up with a bad model, and your predictions can be wildly inaccurate. So, we still need the math nerds, I'm not saying we need to get rid of them, but we need the people interested in the science, in the chemistry, the biology, the microbiology, the geology, to decide that it's worth it to have to do a little bit of maths, to be able to get involved in helping provide answers. Apparently there's no such thing as, I'm not a math person. Apparently we can all do it. It just takes a little more work for some of us. And I'm not talking about crazy Einstein maths, just standard stuff. In fact, what I do is so focused on the science, I didn't even feel like an engineer until I moved to a science faculty. And I was a bit surprised that the attitude was there. It was kind of like, the environmental systems are too complex. I could never put a number on that. As an engineer, you're trained to think differently. You're trained to think a decision has to be made. Not putting a number on it is a luxury I don't have. And as well as the people to make the models, we also need the people sitting on the other side of the desk, the regulators, to have a little bit of experience in modelling. The issue there is uh, the output from these models that they're being asked to assess can be so complicated, uh, it can be very disorientating, and it can be hard to see the weaknesses. I had one case where I was looking at a lake that was drying out and acidifying at the same time. And so the output from the model was looking down on the lake, and the lake's blue to start with, but it's a rainbow colour bar, and at the bottom of the scale is red, bad, acid, and all the colours of the rainbow in between. So I had to show these poor environmental regulators who hadn't worked with any modelling in the past this movie of their lake dying a death of a thousand rainbows. <laughs> this poor lake just swirled down to this blood red pool in the dust. And I was expecting a lot of questions, but silence. And then after a while someone said, could you play that again? The, uh, the trick is you don't have to have done much modelling to understand how sensitive the results can be to the assumptions that you make. And at that point, you develop like laser eyes and you can see through the gloss and you can see the weaknesses. So we need to train more people who say, rainbows, whatever. Tell me more about your assumptions and how that affects your predictions. My path to this point didn't have anything to do with being obsessed with maths or anything or being passionate about it. Instead, it started with growing up in Tasmania. Tasmania has rainforest, World Heritage listed temperate rainforest, where temperate means cold, but it is beautiful. And there are also historical mining towns. So on a family holiday to the west coast to see the rainforests, you go through forests and mountains, and then as you approach the mining towns, the historical mining towns, the trees start to drop away. And then when you get to the town, it's like a moonscape. There's just these bare hills. And every now and then there are these bright colours, these red, yellows, oranges, staining, like someone's been painting sunsets and their paint has been running into the rivers. And my dad was in the mining industry. So he could explain, there are certain minerals that are safe underground, but when we bring them to the surface, they react with the air and they produce acid. 
and that's what caused the beautiful colors. <laughs> These are common minerals, they're everywhere, they're mine sites everywhere, and it's a natural process, but it's accelerated and it's concentrated by mining. And if left unabated, it can continue for hundreds of thousands of years. And then there was this lake that was fluorescent blue, but that was from the copper and the water. And then there was this river that was either red or pea soup, depending on if they were discharging that day. It was just all very surreal, you know, and even more surreal to get back to town and realize almost nobody else knew. Not everyone could have a dad who could explain. So in grade nine or whatever it was, when people start saying, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? I had my answer ready. I was going to try and clean up my dad's mess. <laughs> and I now know that we can do things in a more sustainable way. It's not all doom and gloom. For most of the activities mankind comes up with, there is a path, and my day job is part of making that happen. The exhilarating bit of being an environmental engineer is I get to work with lakes, with coastal oceans, with rivers, and aquatic ecosystems. I get to work with soils and the forests they support. I get to work with aquifers, like the ones here below our feet tonight that provide Perth's drinking water. And they could have recharged 20,000 years ago when the sea level was 120 meters lower and you could walk to Rottnest. The main thing I'm interested in is water quality. So if I take a sample of the river or a stream, it's like I'm doing a blood test on the planet. Hmm, what ails you, Earth? Why is this acidic? Where did all the arsenic come from? Or if we're looking into the groundwater, we're trying to understand where to take it in the most sustainable way. You're looking down into the geology. I can use the geophysical information, like it's an X-ray or ultrasound. Uh, and so you're trying to see where the structures are and where you can put your bore. Should I put it there? Should I put it over there? Oop, too close to the coast, that one's salty. But if I put it over there, will I be taking water from that groundwater dependent wetland over there that's full of endangered tortoises? Or if I'm trying to build a mine, I'm going to be bringing this reactive material to the surface, how can I store it so that it will be benign? Or if I'm trying to clean up this contaminant spill, once it's in the groundwater, will it even be possible to clean up? And let's start putting some dollars on what it really would have been worth to prevent it happening in the first place. And that's where we get to the excruciating bit of being an environmental engineer. Sometimes mankind does stuff that stuffs stuff up. And as with most professions that people go into because they care, a direct consequence of having trained yourself to try and help solve the problems is that you end up at the front line and you see things you wish you didn't have to see. It's particularly excruciating if it was preventable, if we knew it was going to happen. But being there in the thick of it can also be the empowering part of being an environmental engineer. If you've done the hard yards and you're in the room, you can say, there are things you need to know to make this decision, and I can see you don't know them. Let me help you. And that can be a fantastic antidote to the, the rising sense of helplessness that can build up when you sit at home and you see things on the news that you have no control over. This way you're in the room, you're trying to make a difference, and you can put your energy into trying to find solutions. Well, I hope I've given you a bit of a window into the world of environmental engineering. It's not some soft, fantasy job for hippies, and it's not abstract things for happening far away. There are real environmental impacts happening here and now. But for most of them, we now know enough that we can see them coming, and there's things we can do about it. We just have to make sure the next generation of potential engineers isn't sitting at home thinking, well, I like science, but math is a bit dull. I might get a bit bored sometimes. It's not worth it. OK, young people, over here, secret for you. Unless you're one of those truly rare beings who has a gift for maths, learning the maths probably is going to be a little bit dull sometimes. But that's only because you don't know what you can do with it yet. And I've just given you some examples of what I do with it, and I'm no maths genius, so you can do it too. So just hold your nose, get through those maths classes, and keep your eye on the prize. You will be equipping yourself with the tools to help us collectively pull together everything we know about science, and then decide our path forward in the most sustainable way possible. So, young people, hurry up and choose to own the maths, and let's make it happen.